I've spent the last few years learning how to design chips, and I've got to be honest, it's been a pretty bumpy ride. One of the hardest things is, once you get your chips back, if something's wrong with it, how can you test it? When I make a PCB, I can easily inspect it. I can see if there's something wrong. But with the chip, all the wires and the transistors are hidden inside. There's no way to get to them. So is there a way to look inside the chip and trace the tiny wires? I met Thomas Iducas last year at the Free Silicon Conference in Paris, where he showed some amazing images of a chip that he'd scanned using a particle accelerator. I asked if I could bring my chip along and get it scanned too, and incredibly, he said yes. So join me on my journey to the Swiss Light Source Particle Accelerator facility. I'm making my way towards this synchrotron at the Paul Scherer Institute to bring my first chip design to life in the form of a 3D image. And for all my concerned viewers out there, don't worry, I won't be sticking my head in it. What we'll really be doing is using the accelerator to make x-rays a billion times more powerful than a hospital x-ray machine. We'll fire those through the chip and onto a custom-made image sensor that captures the scattered rays. With this data, we can build an image and look inside my chip. In other words, it's gonna be f***ing awesome. Ultimately, the question is, will the manufactured chip match my design? And can the Swiss light source handle my mission? Let's find out. So we just got here to the Swiss light source SLS, and I can't believe they've even given me my own badge. I can get in whenever I want. Oh. The Swiss light source is this big donut looking thing in the foreground. It's based on the Paul Scherer Institute facility, and it's really enormous. It takes about eight minutes to walk around, or two minutes by scooter. Tell us a little bit about your how the experiment works. Okay, so we want to image chips, which are like flat objects. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing, if you want to do a three-dimensional imaging of a chip, you typically do tomography. So if you have an X-ray beam, uh, it hits the sample, you record an image and you keep rotating. But as you see, chips are flat, so sometimes the X-rays go through straight away. Sometimes they need to go through the whole volume, so it becomes difficult to do tomography of okay. chips. Tomography fails, so what we do instead, we image the chip like this using laminography. So each position on the chip where the beam hits, it uh, goes through the same thickness, and as we rotate, we can do 3D imaging. I'm here with Nick on this uh, bridge that goes over the, the ring. We're not allowed to get in because it's all shielded. So uh, what, what are we seeing here? Uh, so yeah, we're seeing a great overview of the, the whole facility. So it's a synchrotron, so it's a big uh, donut-shaped building. And if we look down here, we can see basically what's happening inside the, the accelerator tunnel. On the right-hand side, we have a booster ring attached to the, the inner wall. In the middle, we have the actual synchrotron storage ring. And on the left-hand side with the red lights uh, is an example of uh, where a beamline would be. So when we go to the beamline, you'll, you'll see it there. There's quite a few beamlines at the Swiss Light Source, and we're just going to be visiting CSACs. That stands for Coherent Small Angle X-ray Scattering. Okay, the big concrete wall that we see in the background here, this is the shielding for the, the synchrotron ring, and our X-rays come out here through this shielded pipe and through into our optics hutch. Okay, so this is our optics hutch. Uh, we take white beam from the synchrotron source. It passes through a series of slits and apertures for conditioning of the beam uh, into a monochromator. So we use a double crystal monochromator. This allows us to choose a single wavelength of, of X-rays, uh, another a mirror, and then finally through into the experimental end station where we conduct the measurements on the chips today. So the X-rays from the ring come through the tube behind this wall and then the beam passes through all of here and it enters the experimental chamber where the sample rotates and it's being scanned. So when the x-rays hit the sample, the light scatters and it goes towards the detector. And since air attenuates the x-ray beam, uh, we have an evacuated flight tube such that x-rays don't attenuate and it propagates five meters towards the detector. Our detector is inside this tube, so it's uh, an evacuated detector. It operates in vacuum, and it can count individual photons arriving at each pixel. Yeah. The pixels on this sensor are quite large. They're 75 microns in size, 
which is about 40 times bigger than the ones in your smartphone and it's a 1.5 megapixel sensor. This is what the samples look like. This isn't actually mine, mine's in the machine right now. The sample gets screwed in right here in the middle. Okay, so we've got the sample locked away here. And the next thing is to exit this room and do something called a search procedure, which means validating there's nobody in the room so that when we turn on the x-rays, no one can get hurt. So the first thing we've got to do is come over here, look for the flashing blue buttons, press this one, it's going to start making a funny noise. Flashing blue button, final one here. Safety tool complete. Set prohibited, and then turn on the x-rays. So we've completed the search of the hutch now, and it's time to start a scan on the sample. And it's as easy as that. What you can see moving down is a camera. It's difficult to get everything lined up with the main sensor, so the camera lets us see roughly what the position is. Then we move it down out of the way so that we can bring the flight tube in really close to the sample. And then how long does it take to do a scan? Uh, so at the moment it's taking about uh, five to 10 seconds per, per angular projection. And we're needing several hundred projections before we can make a, a full 3D image of the, of the chip. We've set the machine to do a core scan of two millimeters by two millimeters. That takes about 10 minutes, so I've sped the footage up here. Later, when we're ready to do a super fine scan down at the nanometer scale, it will take at least four or five hours. Every time the sample rotates, the machine needs to move the sample back so that the bit that we're examining can stay right in the middle of the beam. From the back, we can see the laser interferometers that make sure the machine is always precisely positioned. Right, so as we're doing the laminography scan, this is plotting the, the sample position throughout the scan. So basically as we're scanning, we see each point in the scan where we collect a diffraction pattern. So the whole orange thing is the X-ray beam, and in mm -hmm. the center, it's a bit blue and there's some black spots. Um, the reason why it's darker in the center is because there's um, a beam stop. So it blocks uh, the direct beam from reaching the detector, otherwise it would burn it. Mm -hmm. And in the background, you can see the sample moving. So as the sample is uh, scanned through the X-ray beam, you can see the shadow of the sample uh, shifting in the background. So you were having problems earlier today with my microchip. Can you explain like what the challenge is? Yeah, okay. So as the sample rotates, it slightly vibrates. Not much, but a little bit, and it causes problems. So we need to align them for the 3D reconstruction to work. And the alignment is typically based on uh, features that can be easily identified. So for example, if you have a panorama imaging with your mobile phone, as you know, scan the field, your hand vibrates, but the algorithm can find features such as trees or houses or whatever, and match them between different frames and combine them together precisely. Here, the features are lines and line edges. So they're not very unique and it's hard to tell which line edge belongs to the same line edge at a different rotation angle so because it could be any line edge uh, within the field of view and that's the challenge like identifying which edge matches which edge at which angle because they all look the same like edges <laughs> <laughs> so thomas got down to some matlab and python hacking to try to get the images to align better while we were taking more scans. You can see this really detailed scan happening in the background. They stayed another few days, but I left and flew home to Valencia. About a week later, Thomas showed me the images reconstructed from the data. Hey, that looks cool. It's so amazing to see the inside of a chip that I designed in so much detail. Talking of chip design, this is my ASIC clock. This is the chip that runs it. It was my first ever chip and the clock is one of nine designs inside. If you want to learn how to design your own chips and even get them made, then check out my Zero to ASIC course and sign up for the newsletter. Thomas also sent me some very high resolution images, each one a little further down inside the chip. So let's take a closer look at the images and compare them with the design files I sent to eFabless. We'll start with a normal optical scan from the top. I've lined up the x-ray image so you can see they're the same. Take a look at these little blocks of metal fill. 
and here's a render of the files I sent to get manufactured. They don't have the fill because it's added after I send the files. These top horizontal lines are what provides power to the chip. As we drop down through the layers you can see these wires that connect the top power to the layers underneath. This 3D render matches really nicely. As we keep going down through the layers of the chip, we can see how the overall layout of the cells are the same on the render as in the X-ray. Zooming into the top corner, you can see how the metal traces connect the cells into the digital machine that makes the clock tick. All these little dots are the little pillars of metal that join the signal wires on different layers. And here's just the local interconnect layer. It's made of polysilicon and it's used inside the standard cells to connect up the MOSFETs. If you want to find out more about this technique and how it works, then you can watch this interview that I did with Thomas. I want to say a special thanks to Thomas, Nick and the rest of the Beamline crew for inviting me to take part in the experiment and helping me make some awesome images of my first ever chip. Blue buttons.